Welcome. I'm Claire Schaefer. I write sewing books and collect vintage fashions, which I use for research. Today I'm going to show you some techniques and explain how couture differs from traditional home sewing techniques. For full disclosure, I am the author of Couture Tailoring and Couture Sewing Techniques. I've selected a few bits and pieces from these books and my patterns for Vogue for this video. This video focuses on couture tailoring techniques. Periodically, I see posts comparing home sewing techniques from the 1950s to couture. Admittedly, there are a few similarities, but the techniques are not the same. At first glance, this Balenciaga jacket is just a pretty feminine design from the 1960s. It has a notch collar, bound buttonholes, and three-quarter sleeves. When you hold the collar up, you can see this fabulous technique for perfect collar corners. This is the only jacket on which I have seen this particular technique. However, there are many couture techniques which begin with wrong sides together. This technique begins with the top collar and under collar wrong sides together. Then the edges and corners are finished. Many of you can skip these directions or you can always return to review them. We'll return to the Balenciaga jacket later to discuss a few additional secrets. This ensemble is attributed to Ungaro. It doesn't have a label, but I found several similar Ungaro suits. The double-breasted jacket has a V neckline, bound buttonholes, and kimono sleeves. The original buttons were bone, dyed to match the jacket fabric. One was lost, so I replaced the buttons with gold-colored buttons. There's nothing unusual about these bound or fabric buttonholes. There are several different methods for making bound buttonholes depending on the fabric. The silk-covered snaps are pretty straightforward too. The front facings are a different story. This is a single extended facing from the hem to the shoulder seam. The extended or cut on facing is cut in one with the front. There's no seam at the edge. A fold at an edge is always preferred to a seam because it is less bulky. To manipulate the fabric along the neck edge, a fold was used at the top buttonhole. The fold was cut as needed to finish the back of the buttonhole. An important detail, which you can't see, is a bias stay. The stay was hand sewn to the folds on the wrong side so the edges would not stretch out of shape and the folded edge would have an attractive roll. The stay was cut on the bias from silk organza and pressed to remove all of the stretch. Then it was sewn into the jacket. This Dior jacket was fabricated in a metallic brocade. A home sewing or ready-to-wear pattern would have had a separate facing pattern for the front edge. Instead, the Dior has an extended facing with a dart at the bottom. An organza stay was sewn to the fold line on the wrong side to prevent the edge from stretching. Many home sewers think the lengthwise grain or warp doesn't stretch. The warp doesn't stretch as much as the weft or cross grain, and some fabrics stretch more than others. If you stretch the front edges when you're making a garment, the edges will swing toward the sides when it's finished. I created a similar design for Vogue patterns. All of the patterns in this video are out of print. Now I want to introduce split or pieced facings, 
which are generally overlooked in home sewing. This jacket is part of a wool tweed country suit by La Chasse. La Chasse was a couture house in London. The padded skirt, the section below the waist, dates the jacket to the late 40s or perhaps the early 50s after Dior's new look. The jacket has a split facing. The split facing has a separate facing on the lapel and an extended facing that begins at the first button. Notice that the grain for the separate facing is parallel to the edge of the lapel instead of being parallel to center front. Split facings are generally used when the fabric for the lapel is different from the jacket, so I was surprised since this suit is a wool tweed. However, the new grain reflects the light differently and is more attractive than the bias edge would be. This is the pattern I designed for Vogue. I eliminated the padding on the jacket skirt, but like the La Chasse, the jacket pattern has a split facing. Piece facings are frequently used on jackets with shawl collars, like this Man Boucher. Man Boucher was an American couturier who began his career in Paris. He returned to America when the Nazis invaded France and his employees were drafted. The bias trim was hand sewn onto the collar and the flaps have no pockets. I was surprised about the flaps and pockets, but I found this on several couture garments. This Dior also has a split facing, like most tuxedo jackets. The collar is satin. Split facings are used for a variety of reasons. Fabric cost, weight, texture, and to shift the grain to the edge of the collar. They are particularly nice for coats, so the contrast fabric doesn't show when you walk. Back to the Balenciaga. It has a split facing that ends at the top button and a dart that begins at the bottom button. This jacket would have benefited from a split facing, so the stripes wouldn't have fallen off the lapels. Now I want to show you some design ideas for the jacket lapels that are easy to duplicate. Most pattern making books and commercial patterns cut the lapels and facings on the same grain as the front, which is usually parallel to the center front. That's only one option. This Yves Saint Laurent jacket has a surplus cut and the facings are cut so the grain follows the edge. This isn't difficult on a surplus cut since the edges are generally straight. This sample allows you to compare the difference. On the left lapel, the grain is parallel to the edge of the lapel. On the right lapel, it is parallel to center front. Which do you like better? The lapels on this jacket are similar, but quite different. This is also an Yves Saint Laurent jacket. The fabric is an ottoman weave, which has horizontal ribs. And as you can see, the fabric dances when you photograph it. I'll show you the collar. I've enlarged the photo so you can see the ottoman weave easily. The lapels were cut so the edges are on the cross grain, parallel to the ridges of the ottoman weave. This is one of my favorite jackets. The fabric on the lapels of this Yves Saint Laurent jacket was cut so that the plaids frame the edges attractively. Just in case you wonder, the plaids on the seams where the facings join the front don't match, but it doesn't matter because the seams don't show. Here's another sample so we can compare the lapels which have a gentle curve. The right lapel and pattern were cut by the pattern with the grain parallel to the center front. The left lapel and pattern were cut with the grain parallel to the edge. 
This Yves Saint Laurent jacket was the inspiration for an early Vogue pattern. The lapels on this jacket have a slight curve. This is the pattern I designed for Vogue. You probably have it in your pattern stash. Just for fun, before we continue, take a fabric rectangle and make a small tuck on one long edge. You can immediately see the beginning of a curved edge. When working on a jacket, I begin with both rectangles for the lapels so I can shake them at the same time. Shaping the facings is not difficult. I recommend using thread tracings at the outset. But after you have shaped a couple of facings and understand the principles, you can frequently shape the facings with an iron. When needed, use ease bastings to improve the shape at the curve. In home sewing, the center front is usually located at the center of a stripe, sometimes the dominant stripe, sometimes the recessive stripe. On this jacket, the small gold stripe is at center front. Hmm, they didn't learn that rule at Dior. What do you think about the center front on this Dior ensemble? The center is not in the center of a stripe. Instead, the center front is at the edge of the dominant stripe, and the balance appears to be a little off on the jacket, but it matches the skirt at center front. What do you think? Did you notice the bound buttonholes and how they are matched to the fabric? On this Yves Saint Laurent jacket, the center front is located on the recessive stripe, but not at the center. On this Yves Saint Laurent jacket, the center front is almost in the center of the dominant stripe. More importantly, notice how the plaids match on the jacket skirt. On this Chanel jacket, the center front is near the edge of the recessive stripe. When planning a plaid layout, I generally begin at center back. The center back and collar must match. This is a rule from bespoke tailoring for men. I try to match the plaids on the side seams. The most important thing is to avoid two dominant or two recessive stripes next to each other. Generally, when I get to the center front, if I don't like the plaids at the center front, I adjust the front sections to improve the design, and if I still don't like it, I can always go back and adjust the side seams. This Valentino ensemble has raglan sleeves and a zipper at center front. The ensemble would be worn like a dress, and the jacket would not be removed when worn. This is the skirt with a slip top that was worn with the jacket instead of a skirt with a waistband. There are several reasons women prefer a skirt with a slip top instead of a waistband. It doesn't have to fit as snugly, and it will be more comfortable when fitting. It won't be too tight after lunch, and it won't ride up or slip down. Also, it can be let out easily. This is the inside of the slip top. The skirt has a grosgrain or petersham ribbon at the waist. When the skirt is new, it can be held in as much as two inches and ease to the ribbon. If the waist is too tight, later the ribbon can be replaced with a longer ribbon. The English couturier Victor Edelstein told me that he always made the waist on bridal gowns two inches larger, just in case it needed to be let out before the wedding. At the zipper, the ribbon should be one quarter inch or half a centimeter shorter than the skirt, so there will be no stress on the zipper. Notice that the zipper in the skirt was sewn in with running stitches, not prick stitches. The running stitches can be sewn so that they barely show on the outside of the garment. The fell stitches at the edges of the zipper tape actually secure the zipper. 
the edges of the seam allowance of the slip top were overcast by hand because overcasting is the softest, least conspicuous seam finish. Before we leave this interesting ensemble, I want you to notice the relationship of the plaids on the jacket and skirt. There is no interruption of the plaid pattern as your eye moves from the jacket to the skirt. This Dior Ensemble is another example of how the plaid design continues from the jacket to the skirt. I've saved my favorite technique for last. This is a pair of Yves Saint Laurent trousers. In the 50s, ladies didn't wear trousers, but I think the technique is so important that I had to include it. The fly placket was machine stitched first, eliminating the problem of sewing over the zipper tape at the bottom. Then the zipper was sewn in by hand with running stitches. Fell stitches were used at the edges of the zipper tape to secure it, and the seam allowance were overcast by hand. The overcasting here is called cross your hand because it's done in both directions. What do you think? Are couture techniques the same as home sewing techniques in the 1950s? If so, make a comment. I'm Claire Schaefer. Thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video, please join my channel. And if you have special requests, please let me know.